Um, yeah, my name is uh, Alexander Inführer. I'm a student from Austria. I'm called uh, on Twitter uh, InsertScript. I'm a pen tester for Q53, and I'm mostly interested in browser security and web security and files which are automatically loaded in the browser. Yeah, when I first started this research, um, I had no clue about PDF actually. I just know it could do some stuff. It's not just text and pictures, but I had no idea. And I also tried to, I didn't want to find memory corruption bugs. I mean, I found three on accident, but I didn't find them on purpose. And yeah, so I started to get all the references I need. I mean, th this is just a, a selection. It's not all of them. And as you can see, you can, if you want to, you can read the, the whole year to understand the stuff. Um, especially the, the specification just for the forms you can put into PDF is larger than the PDF reference itself. So, and you will see why, because it can do quite a bunch of stuff. The lifecycle designer scripting reference is also a separate reference just for JavaScript. So there are two different uh, Java, JavaScript APIs in PDF you can use. And there is FormCalc, which is a really cool language, which is not really well known, and I'm going to show you what it can do. Yeah. First, uh, we'll talk about a little bit of the structure, but uh, we'll just, uh, just a really short introduction. Um, then about, uh, we'll talk about some protection which are in place, uh, what we can, possible text, also some uh, not patched vulnerabilities. Um, then I uh, will talk about how you can load a PDF uh, in your website when you don't allow to upload a PDF and just to, to show it. And in the end, uh, I'm also showing some defense mechanism you can use to protect yourself. Yeah, um, people who know Osh, he loves to do file formats and make pretty pictures of it. And he also did it for PDF. He also did a great talk about the structure and all how you can, uh, what the streams are uh, built of and all about the switches you can use. There are so many. And if you're interested in, in that stuff, watch his talk. It's like one hour. So let's start. Um, at, the, at the beginning, uh, you have the PDF header. Um, it's not enforced at offset zero, so it can be in the first thousand bytes. Um, also, there is in the in the in the reference. As in, if you read the specification, there are two PDF headers, but this is the only one working. I don't know why the other one isn't, <laughs> but um, it's quite funny to know. Then you need the trailer. A trailer can specify a lot of stuff, uh, but it's basically used to, to specify the root object, which uh, basically is the, the starting point of your, um, of your PDF. And as you can see, uh, objects are always uh, referenced by the first and the second number. Um, the second number is like a, a versioning system, but I never used it, it's always zero. Um, yeah. Then come to, then you need the root object. Uh, the root object can specify actions uh, um, like open action, which, uh, which basically tells PDF as soon as the PDF is open, go to this object and execute the action you specify there. There are also other actions which are called alternative actions, where you can say, yeah, when this page is printed, do stuff, when it's opened, when it's closed. And that's the way how you can execute stuff. This is a typically uh, of a, a typically structure of a handmade uh, PDF with some text. Um, as I already told you, if, if you want to know what all the switches do, um, watch the talk of Osh. So, and this is uh, basically an object um, you could use for uh, open action. The first one would say, "Okay, we want to execute JavaScript." Uh, in this case, it's just a simple alert box, so it does nothing really interesting. The another one is the so-called URI action, uh, which tells PDF, yeah, when the PDF is opened, I want to go to this website. So when you load this PDF in web browser, this uh, URL will get loaded automatically. There are also other actions, like the famous launch action, where you could execute uh, external programs, 
which was then dropped because uh, it was used for malware. And there are also other ones like called go to E and go to R, where you can also specify a location where you want to go as soon as the PDF is opened. And you will see you can do some funny stuff with this. The protection place um, is actually not really uh, difficult to understand. For cross-site scripting, there's a big blacklist uh, of protocols, like, for, of course, JavaScript for base script, but also a lot of other protocols. It's quite big. Um, for local file access, there was privileged JavaScript, and they almost dropped the support. Um, you can still execute privileged JavaScript, but you, had, you, have to you have to have the possibility to write in a local JavaScript file in the file system in a special folder. So it's, it's not that interesting as an attack vector anymore. Yeah, for the web context, it's also, as, as long as it's same origin, there is basically no protection. It's, uh, if, if you want to access a, a document via PDF, and it's, as long as it's same origin, it's always okay. And the last are signed documents. I haven't looked into them yet. Um, you can sign a, a document and give them special rights which, which it needs because there are special functions which only work in, in Adobe Reader Pro, but if you sign them and mark this, hey, I need this right, then suddenly it works in Reader 2, um, in the simple standard Reader 2. But if you don't sign it, it just say, no, I don't support it. And you can, there are some really powerful functions you can use when your document is signed. So let's go to the tech vectors. Um, I'm going to show you actually how you can ex still execute JavaScript um, via PDF, although it's to try to block it. Um, also talk about form calc, uh, then a possible header manipulation, and some external entity attacks are found. So cross scripting is basically possible because PDF can change the location in a lot of ways. It, it has uh, native links like standard links you know, and uh, then it supports a subset of XHTML, where it also supports the A tag. Uh, JavaScript can change the location. Uh, all kind of submits can change the location. And actions can also change the location. And uh, they had a lot of bypass in the past, and I thought it's, uh, it's protected, or I didn't find one. But there is one pitfall if you, if you load a PDF, a tech control PDF via embed or object, it's possible to execute JavaScript in the embedding page. So you can change the location. The PDF changed the location to JavaScript, um, colon, alert location or whatever. And then it's executed on the embedding page. And I'm going to show you this now. It's quite funny. Yay. So. Do we need the magnifier? Do you see it? Go away. Can you actually read stuff here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but people in the back. <laughs> so, okay. Just easy. So I'm just going to load this HTML, which uh, loads attacker.com, uh, go to e.pdf. And in go to e PDF, we have an open action, which uh, specifies object seven. And as you can see, I use an action called go to e and, and specified JavaScript uh, handler. And you will see that it will alert the location of the embedding page, or at least it should. <laughs> If my st is still working, I think I have to restart my EA. Yeah, that looks good. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hopefully, we don't lose the <laughs> left <laughs> remaining screen too. Um, so, if we say like victim.com. It will load the PDF from tech.com, and as you can see, it executes the JavaScript in victim.com. So, never embed a tech control PDF via, via embed or uh, object.
Just assume it's a flash file, then you won't do the same. Hopefully. So let's talk about the form call specification. That's a really cool old uh, old language. Uh, what's, it was specified in 1999, and its roots are in the electronic form software from Adobe and Common Spreadsheet software. Um, basically, you can use it in, in the forms. Um, in forms, you can uh, the so-called XFA structure. You have the date. It's one big XML structure with the data, the, f the form fields, um, some configuration, and you can also specify events you want to execute. And these are all the function supports. They're like uh, arithmetic, date, financial, logical, missionary, and string. And they also have all built-in functions. And they're really interesting because the first one is a get function. It's just, just one parameter. You specify a URL, and it retrieves the content and gives it back to you. And also, this is done by using the browser, so all session cookies are sent along. This also works with post, and you can even create a put request. And that's basically how a structure looks. There's a really uh, simple example from, uh, once again, from Arsh. So it's, it's quite easy to test and play around with it. Um, it's like uh, XML HTTP request uh, in JavaScript but I think it's even easier than this. And the cookies are sent too. And if you think a malicious, uh, you, you get a user to, to view um, your PDF, let's say you upload it on Facebook, then you could actually read the whole Facebook page in context of the logged in user. So that's actually quite powerful. And the steps are easy for an attack. You just upload a PDF to the domain you want to attack. Um, then you get the user to visit your page or get him to open the PDF. Um, and then uh, the loaded PDF is in the origin of the, uh, the page you want to, to attack, and then you can just read uh, the f uh, any site you want. So, hopefully, <laughs> I can show you this. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so, once again, I have a HTML file. So the user uh, is going to, to view uh, this HTML file. It's load from victim.com, steal the target PDF. And I, cre I created a PDF which passes the target uh, parameter and then fetches it, passes, passed it on to, to FormCalc, retrieves the content, gets it back to JavaScript, and then alerts it. And in this case, um, it tries to read from the same domain. So we won't get any alert boxes to ask for the user to permission. And we're going to read the secret file secret which is really interesting now. Not really, it's just some random stuff. So, hopefully the screen is, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. If we now load this, uh, attacker.com. Hello? Now in the background, um, if I don't want to start there. Normally I would show you the request, but I'm scared then you won't see anything at all. So basically what's happened now is the attacker page um, loads the PDF from victim.com and uh, tells him to get this file or whatever um, from victim.com and retrieves the content. And in this case, I'm just alerting it. Normally you would send it to the attacker server and um, do whatever you want with it. The, the really scary stuff is you can actually, yeah? It always works when you use the PDF uh, plugin from Adobe. That's, that's necessary. Yeah, assume it's, it's the plugin, not the browser who's doing stuff. But I'm mostly tested on, on EA because that's the standard installation. Most people use different views in Mozilla or Chrome. So, and the funny thing is with this feature, you can um, read CSRF tokens if you want. It's also no, uh, not a bug. I don't know if they're ever going to drop this feature. And it was first mentioned in 2010. Maybe someone knew it before, I don't know. It's from some Russian guys. 
Yeah. So let's talk about the same origin policy. It's like the same in, in Flash. Uh, there was a simple bypass in the past where I just used a re HTTP redirect and suddenly you could read any domain. And just for fun, I used this in combination in form call to create a man in the middle proxy with PDF. But it's really slow because it's not intended to be used as a man in the middle proxy. <laughs> but just for fun. Um, yeah, as soon as you make a, a cross origin request, um, you, you will see the request for cross domain XML and if it's allowed or not. But if you use a redirect, um, it will f send the request. You, you get the post request you sent and re re retrieve the content, but then you can't access it. So it's, it's different from when you, when you specify like cross origin to Facebook. It will say no, that's cross origin. But if you make a redirect, so before you get you go to your own domain, make a redirect to Facebook.com, then it will actually send the request. But you can just uh, you can't access the, the response. This is especially interesting because with form call you can also specify any HTTP header you want. You can override all of them. Okay, not all of them, one not. Because you can't specify the user agent. But you can specify everything else. So you can you, you can even set the content length header, which creates a really interesting problem. And yeah, you can also bypass, of course, any referral checks, host header checks, doesn't matter. Um, the funny thing is when you, you change the content length to one in a post request, but have a big payload, the, the server uh, mostly will um, recognize the, the remaining payload as a new request. So you can you have full, um, basically you can, can create a custom get post or whatever request you want to server. You, you won't get uh, the response back, but if you ever need, I don't know, uh, uh, ran a really weird uh, request, then you can build it with form calc. So then I had a look at external entity attacks because there is XML parser in, in PDF and it also parses a lot of, PD, uh, a lot of XML. Um, it's also uh, bound to, as soon as you, you try to, to fetch any files with XML, it's also bound to the same origin policy. But the problem if, with external entity attacks is you can also use it on the local file system. So if you open a PDF from the local file system, then the origin is the local file system. Yeah, if you have never seen before how an uh, external entity uh, uh, injection looks, um, it's basically you specify an entity name, like, I don't know, if XXA in this case, um, sell its system, and then you specify the location where you want to, to get it from. If you specify in, 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 in PDF tries to, doesn't support actually uh, external entities, or at least they try to not support it. Uh, the first one, um, where I actually get the idea from trying, <laughs> um, is from the paper polyglots cross origin by crossing formats. They found it in xmldata.parse. They fixed it. Then uh, I, found this, I found one myself. Um, we are load XML. This was fixed in April, so I thought, hey, maybe i find another one. And of course I did, because XML also um, has is, uh, the second language, uh, XSLT, to transform the XML. And it's, it's um, either loadable via XML style sheet, or via apply. In JavaScript, you can just apply it. Um, yeah, because I was asked, I put it uh, in the slides, uh, PDF uses the Sablotron XML engine, if anyone knows it. Um, it seems like a really simple XML language uh, engine. And uh, the interesting part here is actually um, XSLT can use external entity again, like, like in, in, in XML too. So it's like, you just specify a really simple XML, then you parse it, and then you just um, de define uh, you transform it how you want, it doesn't matter. Um, just to be has, uh, it just has to be val valid. And um, you specify again an entity from, it again has to be the same origin, but you can uh, specify like, I don't know what you want to read, a JSON file or whatever, and pass it, as, uh, and then it's passed back to the JavaScript, and you can do whatever you want with it. And this is, um, 
if it's loaded, like I said, from the local file system, you could do the same um, with local files. Let's see if I can show you this. So, where is it? So, again, I just use the open action. So, in this case, we specify, hey, we want to execute JavaScript. And as you can see, the first line is just some random XML. And then we specify here that we want to read from victim.com this JSON structure, uh, this JSON file. The problem with XML is uh, it has either to be just text or a valid XML. There are some ways around this, but um, they don't seem to work, or I don't get them to work uh, correctly with PDF, maybe in the next days. Um, and then we just pass. This is the function where the, where, where the first one was found, the, the first XXA one. And then we just apply it and we can read once again, same origin files. Let's see if it's work. So, I think I have a file for this. So once again, I'm just loading the PDF we are embed from attacker.com. So once again, it's loaded from victim.com, and it uses this wound to read like this really interesting JSON structure. Hey ho, VVV. Yeah. So, but there is another one <laughs> um, because you don't even need to use JavaScript. Um, because um, the XFA is XML already, so it's, it has to be parsed, and of course the same one is uh, there too. But there is something really weird going on, because if you're trying to load a style sheet, where uh, the XML style sheet tag, suddenly PDF believes uh, it's on a local file system and tries to find it on the desktop. And if you specify now a, a, a web page. And even if it's the same uh, same domain where it's loaded, it will say, hey, that's a uh, cross-domain uh, um, request. Are you going to allow this? Maybe it's harmful. And this dialog is really interesting. It tells you, yeah, you can allow it, block it, or cancel. And you can remember the decision. And it doesn't matter what you click, it always does the same. It sends the request. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In this case, this, this is not so uh, useful, uh, useful. Yeah? Um, if you open this PDF, is the XMT code executed? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so in this case, it's, uh, uh, you need an out-of-band technique for, um, for to, to retrieve the, the content. Yeah, it's just, it's, if you're familiar with X6, XXA attacks, it's just a normal way to use uh, I think it's the only one out of band technique I need I know to, to extract data. Because we keep, this time we don't have any scripting capabilities, so we, we need to, to fetch the data into one variable, then you create a URL to your own domain, and then send the request. So basically in, in, test, in test we store the file we want to steal, and in the second um, file in send TTT we create um, another uh, variable called send, or all, which uh, creates send. And if we want to retrieve send, it sends the payload to attacker.com. So, I'm into time. Okay, way too fast. <laughs> okay, um, ways to load PDF. Yeah, basically there are two ways, or two common ways to do it. Um, the first one is getting more and more difficult, or actually, I don't, yeah, because a PDF doesn't enforce the header at offset zero, but they have like started again doing blacklisting of certain headers, like all flash headers, because they for, actually they forgot one, but <laughs> then they find it, then they uh, fixed it. Then G, uh, all the GPEG headers, where they also had forgotten one way and Arsh found it, <laughs> and then PNG. TIFF, I don't know, it's like a really big list. So if, if one of these headers before the PDF header, it will just say, I don't know, it's invalid PDF or whatever, and stops rendering. 
So this is uh, not that interesting anymore. Another way is um, if, you, if you type in, in Google how to for, or download of a file, you will get Stack Overflow uh, response with, yeah, set content disposition header to attachment and the content type to uh, application octet binary, I don't know. But this doesn't help actually because you can just uh, load it via embed tag and specify it's an application PDF. Then the browser will see, okay, I will pass this on to the Adobe reader and he will just render it without any problem. So don't rely on this because a lot of people don't uh, believe that uh, the browser should, uh, will download the file, but it's not always the case. <laughs> so, <laughs> to defend yourself, um, I would say uh, try to host the uh, uh, content of, of, from user files on a subdomain or if, if on another domain and use XFrame options header to, to just say, yeah, the, um, my files are just allowed, it, allowed to load, uh, to be embedded from the same origin or ne are actually never allowed. And the, pro the browser recognizes this header and then stops um, and says, yeah, this can't be embedded. And that's actually a quite a, uh, useful uh, way to, to block such attacks. Yeah, for end users, you can either use a different reader or disable uh, JavaScript. Uh, it also blocks form calc if you do this. Um, if you uh, enable protected view, it also stops all the uh, external entity attacks. By stopping means it freezes to death and does nothing and your Internet Explorer is also frozen, but it doesn't send the request. <laughs> it, also, it also does some other stuff, so it's a uh, good idea to, to enable it. It's not enabled by default, actually. So that was it. It was kind of fast, I think. Yeah, it doesn't any. Uh, it doesn't support JavaScript, nor they don't even think about form calc, so it's not. So it's not vulnerable to these attacks. No. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Um, in fact, I have two questions. Um, when you are doing out of bound attacks with expression with XXC. Um, Um, new line, I think, is no problem. I haven't tried how much data you can actually transmit. I think it will be limited to the amount uh, Internet Explorer allows because it's it's using the browser to send it. Actually, I don't think that the the Sablotron engine enforces any restrictions here. So, but I ha haven't tested it so thoroughly. Okay, so you are the browser to limit the requests. Yeah, it's all. It's that's also the reason why it's uh, sent the cookies along. Um, yeah, but uh, the same same origin policies are enforced there too. Um, have you had a look at the uh, differences, at the security difference between the Adobe implementation and Chrome's implementation? Because <laughs> they claim to do some things better, yet they do some things worse, and it would be interesting to see like a table or at least like a list of features what they do better and what they do worse. And what um, I haven't uh, tested for, X, for XML attacks, I haven't tried, tried them yet, but in f case of JavaScript, they have like, they, they pretend to support a lot of functions, but they're doing nothing. So it's, when you try to enumerate uh, objects, there are quite a bunch of them, but they don't seem to work or do anything. And you don't get any error response or anything, so. I'm assuming you've told Adobe about these things. What were their reactions? 
thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so how long ago was that? Um, the newest one, like some days ago, but normally I think that the, the other one's like two weeks ago. So, but it takes some time. It's always in the patch. They, they, they are not the fastest when, they, when it comes to patches, so I didn't want to wait that long. It also works when you just open um, on the local file system with the Adobe uh, directly because it's no difference. In the browser, it's just passed along to the Adobe uh, application, and on the local file system, it's directly started with the with the PDF. But there is there is no difference. It's just yeah. <laughs> I think so. I haven't tested it, but I, I assume that it will work. No, it's overrides the host header. No, I don't know why, but you can, you can, yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Let's go. Sorry, one more. Uh, in the defense section, you were recommending the usage of extra function headers. Um, no more, and more security goes. Into one header and this magic header that does everything. Yet at the same time, the header is supposed to be non standard and nobody knows how to handle this, so it's kind of like a ticking time bomb. And you would have to actually recommend your clients to use something where no one knows where it's going. How do you think this is going to end? <laughs> <laughs> I would say it, it's, it's, be, it's easier for us, but I don't think in, in a point of security. It, it doesn't make much sense. Um, I would have seen some people suggested like additional header just to specify which plugins you want to load. So the website, the website should con could control which plugins uh, the browser is allowed to load. So they could also put it in their the magic header too, <laughs> if they want. But I don't think it's it will improve much. So in five years you're going to have open positions for header managers. <laughs>